So our guest today is a multi-award nominee and multi-platform actress successfully traversing over three decades on Broadway, off-Broadway, on TV and film in so many memorable roles. Fans of planes, trains, and automobiles know her as Susan Page, Neil's wife, in one of the most emotionally powerful endings in a comedy known to man. Thank you very, very much uh, to the very busy Lila Robbins for joining us today. Miss Robbins. Hello, Miss Robbins. Miss Robbins, we'll jump right into it. We saw that your first credit was on stage in 1985, playing the lead as Annie and Tom Stopper's The Real Thing. Um, this was your mid-20s. Um, and of course, when did you know that you wanted to be an actress? At what point did it hit you? Oh, well, um, the story goes. <laughs> no, what I remember was that um, I had a friend and we always celebrated our birthdays together, David Hakenson from St. Paul, Minnesota. And we went to see the very wonderful movie, 101 Dalmatians. And I saw the character of Cruella de Vil and I was like, it was the most glamorous thing I'd ever seen in my life. Those cheekbones, that fur coat, the, the cigarette smoke following her around. And I said, I must play that role. <laughs> so I went home and I wrote a play called The New Year's Eve Crime, which I still have in my closet in a little book. And um, that's, I started doing plays in my basement. And that's, that's how it started. It kind of shifted to music for a while when I got into my teens. I wanted to be Joni Mitchell for a long time. And I studied music in my undergrad work. But after that, it was sort of acting all the way after that. Awesome. That is so interesting that Corella DeVille was your inspiration because a lot of, honestly, I was kind of intimidated about this interview because of all, a lot of the characters you play are very take no guff, like, hard i'm like oh man we cannot be late to this we have to be on point <laughs> i know i'm so mean and dark and nasty and i'm 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 always miss bossy pants so i always get these roles i don't know why i don't know <laughs> um i was when i when i was looking at the imdb the the, the bible of film i there was a bit of irony that stood out to me that I wanted to recognize in the fact that your first role as an actress and uh, what well, the first role of as an actress was playing an actress and activist fighting for social justice. And your career as an actress in real life seems to gravitate towards projects that positively contribute to the social commentary. And I'm talking about like TV series like um, uh, Painfully Relevant, Handmaid's Tale, uh, where you don't play a Martha, but then Homeland, where you do play a Martha, Martha Boyd, the U.S. <laughs> ambassador. Yes. Um, yeah. And a bit more irony, considering your role as Annie in The Real Thing was trying to free a Scottish soldier named Brody, and then Homeland begins with the story of Carrie also fighting for a man named Brody in the midst of political warfare. Are you consciously drawn to stories like this well i would say when i if i i would say that when i read a script and it's got those elements to it that it is more interesting to me but i can't say that i'm consciously you know looking for that or only responding to that or only auditioning i mean it's really just kind of the luck of the draw i think as you know um but i'm just lucky enough to play um interesting complex women or who are usually pretty smart you know i've, I've done a lot of lawyers and you know, ambassadors and doctors and I don't know. Maybe I come off kind of cerebral or something. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> definitely. Now, we'll, we'll definitely get back to Homeland. But before we move on, F. Murray Abram, he also stars in Homeland. And as we noticed that he was also in one of your first films uh, 25 years prior, An Innocent Man. So... We're curious, yes. had you shared any time on set uh, together with of these projects and was there like a reunion moment or any type of reminiscing that was going on? Well, you know, what's crazy is that my first Hollywood movie, no, not my first, it was Innocent Man was not the first. Um, mm -hmm. My first scene in that movie was a scene with F. Murray Abraham. Uh, uh, that was the first scene I did in that film. It was in the, in the jail where I meet him and he's been Tom Selleck's jail mate, I guess. And, uh, so that's one of the, you know, uh, it was sort of baptism by fire because Jeff Marie Abraham was very, very special to me. So I was a habita, habita, habita. And, uh, <laughs> and it went really well. And then I've just seen F. Marie over the years in New York, you know, we're both sort of theater rats and, and, and go to a lot of things and see each other's work. And then seeing him at Homeland, it just seems sort of um, natural that we've, you know, we've known each other for many years. So uh, 
And uh, we're actually working on a project right now about Norman Mailer, um, mm. which got a, got a little uh, waylaid because of the, the pandemic. So uh, hopefully I'll nice. be sharing the stage with him. You know, congratulations on continuing to, to you know, have work during yes. this time. I know we talked to Brad Copeland in LA in the last interview and you know, he's just, he spoke about how it's just, it's kind of goes back to the writer's strike where there's just so many people out of work and, and it's hurting so many people in the industry. So congratulations on, yes. you know, awesome. when you said that you're working and uh, like, don't apologize for that. That's yes, absolutely... stay working, please. Oh. No, but I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful and I realize so, so many people are not working. And uh, for example, my, my partner, Robert Cuccioli does mostly stage work. So for him, it's, it's not working out very well. But I had some of these TV things going that suddenly through their ability to test and uh, make this sort of bubble, we've been able to get back to work and, you know, fingers crossed that it can continue. But uh, yeah, um, in the early months, um, boy, you just feel like yourself has just disappeared because the thing that you do and you love is suddenly you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you really feel this sort of, uh, I felt very bereft and thought, well, who am I if I'm not an actress? You know, it makes you kind of look at yourself just as a person instead mm -hmm. of as a, a, an actor. And uh, luckily this wonderful, as I think, you know, Richard Nelson, the wonderful playwright who wrote these Apple family plays, emailed us all and said, hey, I'm thinking about making some more plays with the Apple family. This was a, a series of plays that we had done, started 10 years ago and did a new play every year for four years. And then on the fourth year, we did all of them together. And then we filmed them for PBS, for local PBS. And uh, then it's been several years since I've been involved uh, with the group. And then these Zoom plays, uh, I guess his claim to fame is that it's the first, not play on Zoom, but a play written for Zoom, where the family is in a Zoom. Yeah. And so it's the first play written for Zoom. And uh, boy, was that a saving grace just to have anything to work on or to focus on. Or, and we had to figure out, I'd never done Zoom before that. And so I had to figure out the Zoom and the light and our set. In fact, I filmed two of them, no, one of them right here in this, in this couch. <laughs> and then the other two I filmed at my mom's house because I was in Minnesota visiting my mother. So I filmed them there, pretending it was just another room in my, in my home in the play. <laughs> And uh, boy, I just felt so grateful just to, to have other actors around me and to be you know, expressing myself and, and playing a character that I love and that I've lived with for such a long time. So that yeah. was really a saving grace, really saving grace. I'm so grateful. I mean, I, the first day back on the blacklist, uh, Megan Boone and I, we did our first you know, take on a scene. We were both just like jumping up and down going, oh my God, we're back in the saddle. We were so happy. <laughs> well, that's, I guess that's a silver lining in everything that it kind of reinvigorates this passion that, uh, I mean, or it, I guess it reminds you that, that what's not to be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. So if there's any silver lining to be found in everything, I guess that would be something. Yes, um, I agree with you. I've often said that to friends, not, you know, going to the theater, sitting in a chair, watching actors do a play, Oh, when they were showing those metropolitan operas, you know, the streaming you could do. I listened to a lot of those when I was, you know, cleaning out the cupboards, you know, taking everything out during the beginning of the pandemic. I think everyone's got really clean closets right now. Um, <laughs> I would listen to the operas and see the audience there and go, oh, yeah, I remember doing that and how mm -hmm. I just took it for granted. I took it for granted. But we also have taken um, perhaps people that are close to us for granted mm -hmm. because we have busy, busy, busy lives and we have lives on our social media and we have lives here but then suddenly you're in this place with your person if you're yeah. lucky enough to have one right. and you sort of see them in a whole new light and you actually get to go explore them in a more intense and sort of consistent way which is a beautiful mm -hmm. thing i think for families especially families with like little kids and stuff i think right. it's, i mean it must be very very difficult but it's also probably a real blessing. Life, ha life has a way of reminding you what's what's really important sometimes, and I think that's what happened to all to us all. I think that's really what it's yes, about. Yes, I agree with you. I want to go back to the start of your film career. You were already acting alongside names like Steve Martin, John Candy, and Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, of course. Stanley Tucci, Tucci in The Equalizer, Kyle MacLachlan in Dreambreakers, uh, Tom Selleck in uh, Innocent Man. And then Winona Ryder and Jeff Daniels in uh, Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael. 
was it your stage performances that opened the door, like swung the doors open like this seemingly um, for these kind of opportunities? Well, you know, my dream when I was at grad school, my dream was to be a, a theater actress and to, to, and to actually go back to Minneapolis and work at the Guthrie Theater. That, that was kind of my dream. And then getting out of school and getting the real thing very quickly. And I had a great agent, Sam Cohen, may rest in peace. Uh, he was very powerful. And he, I think, you know, was trying to get me uh, a really early start in film. But in some ways I, I ended up saying no to a lot of things that I should have said yes to. I wanted to be really uh, selective about the kinds of movies I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up saying no to, um, some projects that maybe I, sh I should have done. Um, and I, in some ways, you know, I did the occasional film, I did the occasional TV thing, but ironically, my, my TV career really kind of kicked in about six years ago when I did Homeland. I mean, I'd done a lot of stuff for HBO, small roles along the way, but Homeland was the first really big, uh, very kind of hot show for me. And it really, um, um, elevated my opportunities for other things after that. And it's kind of ironic to have it so late in life, you know, whereas a, as a 20 year old, I was not getting those movie roles where I was gonna be the leading lady. Um, I don't know, I think there was a part of me that was a little um, shy and a little not really knowing how to handle the business and intimidated by a lot of things. And so in some ways I lacked the confidence to sort of say, yeah, I'm going to be, you know, Julia Roberts or whatever. Uh, it just didn't happen for me. As a result, I did many, many, many plays, and I'm so grateful that I did all of them, whether it was Chekhov, Ibsen, Strindberg, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams. I'm so grateful for that time. And I always thought, oh, it'd be great to have more of a film career. But I was always very happy wherever I was doing whatever work I was doing. Speak, speaking of you being happy, let's go back to that time. Out of, all the, out of all the projects that, of course, that he mentioned, is there a favorite memory from those years, whether it's in front of the camera, on stage, or off scene? Is there any favorite memory or something that comes to mind from those years? Well, I just remember when I got into the real thing, I was like, I was like a deer in the headlights. You know, we, I rehearsed with Mike Nichols a, a little bit and then the stage manager a lot. And I think we had two weeks and the stage revolved and literally I would go through one door and the dresser would rip off my clothes and put on something else and shove me through another door. And because the stage was revolving half the time, I didn't even know where I was uh, in the whole thing. I mean, there was just a lot of uh, lessons, you know, a lot of, but I learned, I, I guess I feel so grateful because I got a chance to work with some really great actors and, and they could teach me so much about all my little bad young actor habits. <laughs> uh, speaking of working with really great actors, let's talk about from there, you go on to play uh, Victoria Heller in the TV series, Gabriel's Fire. And this is from 1990 to 91, alongside the great, great James Earl Jones. And at this yeah. point, you acted on stage, you put a few films on your resume. Now you're a regular on TV series. Can you talk about the transit, what the transition was like? And of course, what, what it was like working with, I'm pretty sure my biological father, he just will not claim me, Mr. James Earl Jones. <laughs> oh boy, getting, getting a series regular, that was my first time for that show. And uh, in some ways I was very naive about it. I didn't realize what a big deal it was. You know, it was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go do this job. You know, I didn't, I wasn't in the business in that way where I was like, you know, oh, wow, this is amazing. But to be with James Earl Jones was amazing. And we, um, we had good times, you know, I, we had some, scene, some scenes together and I was hoping there'd be more, but in some ways his storyline was somewhat separate from mine. So we would kind of share the show. Um, I, asked what, I asked James once, I said, James, how do you choose the roles that you, you know, that you choose when you're looking at material? He goes, oh, Lila, it's all income. <laughs> and he would come and say, "Oh, I it's haven't all, earned my paycheck today." <laughs> it's all in the come. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, ironically, we shot that in L.A. And I finally had some money, and I, so I came back to New York. And I, the first thing I did was buy my apartment, which was the best thing I ever did. Uh, I didn't squander it, you know, with other things. I went, "Okay, I'm going to get a home for myself." Mm -hmm. And uh, and suddenly, I, I walk outside, and James Earl Jones is on the corner. I was like, James, what are you doing in New York? He said, I live right here. I live literally, oh, literally a block away from him. He must have thought I was stalking him. 
because, <laughs> because suddenly I'm living right next door. Isn't that funny? <laughs> um, so it was just crazy to run into him. But uh, we would, um, we would, you know, work through those scripts and he was just so, so charming and so gentle and kind. And I've gone to see him perform over the years and, um, and I always share the memory of that being my, my first TV, sh you know, show. And, and he's just such a wonderful actor, wonderful actor. I hope we get to see him again on the stage in particular. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in 1995, you star in Live New, Live New Girls as Rachel. Uh, and this wouldn't be your first time working with Kim Cattrall. Uh, nearly a decade later, you'd appear in an episode of her show, Sex in the City. Um, is there a relationship there that, that that's like responsible for that reunion or was that just a happy coincidence? No, it was a happy coincidence. Uh, in early days, you know, Kim and I would go out for a lot of the same roles. Um, and uh, I don't know, I guess, when did I really meet her? Was probably doing Live New Girls, I think. Uh, and we all had a good time with that. I mean, that was a silly, fun film. I, <laughs> my mother doesn't like seeing that on my resume, Live New Girls. She doesn't really like seeing that much. But uh, it was fun to work on that. And then... Um, I think I would run into her occasionally, you know, at the theater, like you do in New York. And then the Sex and the City thing happened. I don't, I, I that was just a coincidence. What was really wonderful about that uh, is I got to work with Baryshnikov because I played Mikhail Baryshnikov, Baryshnikov's best friend. And I'm gonna call him Misha because he says that I can. Uh, he is, my parents are immigrants from Latvia and uh, Misha grew up in Latvia. His parents were Russian, but he grew up in Latvia too. So when I went into the makeup trailer, I started speaking Latvian to him. Oh, wow. And, and, wow. Sa and Sarah Jessica Parker came in and was like, what are you guys doing? What are you doing? We're speaking Latvian. <laughs> and I grew up doing little Latvian folk dances, you know, like little Lat Latvian, you know, little whatever. And mm -hmm. my little outfit. And I said to Misha at the end of the day, I said, do you know how to do the Latvian polka? And he said, yes. And I said, would you dance it with me? And he did. So oh, I, have, I have danced with Baryshnikov. <laughs> Talk about something to put on the bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of reunions, in 1997, you start an episode of Nothing Sacred, starring Ann Dowd. Now, of course, well known for her role in Handmaid's Tale, which you also are yes. appearing. Did you two work directly with each other on either one of those projects or was it coincidence or what was going on? No, in fact, I didn't, frankly, I didn't know that Anne was on Nothing Sacred. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's news to me. Um, we didn't have anything <clears throat> together and we didn't have anything together on, um, on uh, Handmaid's Tale either. But I have run into her at the theater and we're, we're friendly. Uh, but I've never had the, the, the pleasure of working with her. I think she's an amazing actor. Yeah, she's she's terrifying. Yeah, yeah. she's terrifying on that show. It's pretty, yeah, for Handmaid's Tale, I mean, I did the one episode, so I, uh, and all of it was with uh, Yvonne um, and some other uh, supernumeraries. What's the proper word these days? Not extras. You don't want to call them that. Supporting, Supporting artists. artists. Supporting artists. I like that. Scene builders. Scene builders. They're building the scene. We need them to yes. be better. Let's do that. Let's say that. <laughs> Um, in 1999, you starred in Clint Eastwood's True Crime yes. alongside the likes of James Woods, Isaiah Washington, Dennis Leary, and of course, Clint Eastwood. Um, what was that experience like being directed by one of Hollywood's true greats? Well, I, as I recall, I think my only scene was with Clint Eastwood. Uh, and he casts people off of tape, so I hadn't even met him. Oh, wow. So I was in the makeup trailer. He came in to get his makeup and it was like, hello, should we run lines? And we ran lines. And the next thing you know, we got in the sack. So that was, talk about baptism by fire. Um, and uh, he, he was directing it as well. So it was very interesting. His set is very quiet because he'll, there won't be that kind of silence, silence. Okay, rolling camera, roll sound. Okay, action. He literally just looks up and goes like this and everybody starts doing their job. So wow. you, you ease into the scene without all that extra stuff to make you subconscious about the fact that you're filming something now. Mm -hmm. You're just, you just goes like that and you just start doing it. And we did, you know, I was so, you know, intim I mean, intimidated and we had a love scene. So I was like, Mr. Eastwood, is it, o is it okay if I stroke your chest here? And he's like, yeah, that's okay. Let's just do it again. Let's just do it again. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and he said when he was younger, he said when he was younger, you know, he used to be very shy about, you know, nude scenes and things. And so all the dressers would come around him, you know, between takes and cover him up with towels and all that. And, 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 and now he said, you know, and now I just, you know, get out of the bed and put on the pants. I'm just an old whore. <laughs> <laughs> and we got all the way and we got all the day's work done in a half a day by lunch we would be done he's notorious okay. for that he's so in so tune with his um with his crew that you shoot and by lunch you're done for the day you're done with okay. the work of the day he's, he works so quickly and so efficiently and so um uh, sensitively and he knows how to talk to actors and wow. being yeah. one and he you know he was in the scene as well so it was he was wearing a lot of hats that day yeah so did he like did he have to shoot the scene and then go watch the playback or did he have like a trust with the director of photography i think he didn't watch them then but i do remember us watching some dailies right after lunch like he said oh you can come see what we did so then we watched a bunch of them in the afternoon you mentioned earlier working on a lot of TV shows, of course not, and some of them being bigger, and then you got the Homeland, of course. But if we take it back, there is one big show you did work on in 1991 and uh, in 2001. You star in The Sopranos, playing a young version of Tony's mom. You mentioned earlier being cerebral and things like that. So tell me what it was like portraying such a complicated character, to well, say the least. Really... <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, right. I mean, it was a real... Um... Uh, di a diver uh, not diversion, you know, I, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, something I, I wasn't usually typecast that way. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I was kind of, I, I was this uh, New Jersey Italian, you know, mom. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I watched a lot of uh, Nancy Marchand because I was supposed to be her, you know, in the past. Right. And so I just kept watching the show and watching her mannerisms and the way she moved. And they gave me a, a, a different nose. They changed my nose a little bit to match Nancy's a little bit more. And it was just so fun to be cast that way. You know, mm -hmm. it was just a real uh, uh, diversion is not the word I'm looking for, but come it's on. diverse. Right? It's so diverse. Your range was everywhere. You're so diverse. <laughs> I mean, just thinking about it, like you say, you were used to doing it one way and now you get to explore this other side of you and do things different. And you got a free nose job. Who's complaining about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my favorite moment in that was when I took the fork and, and said to the little Gandolfini, I could stick this fork in your eye. That's my favorite line I have ever said in my life. <laughs> you never knew what to expect from that show. And no. like, uh, in a, in a I know. cast of characters full of like seedy, violent people, his mom probably scared me one of the, one of the most. Just it was. Oh it was, yeah. There's it a heartbreaking element to it because it's oh. like the opposite of what a mom would be. Absolutely, and you know, I I, did, I met James. He came into the makeup trailer, and I met him very briefly. And boy, was he taking his work seriously. He mentioned that he uh, had an assistant who would help him run lines every night after his day's work. You know, he had to do a lot of the talking on the show. And when you're a series regular, you, it's, it's hard to keep up with all those lines. Right. And so then he would go and work with the assistant, just pounding those lines to be ready for the next day. And I think he also had uh, hired um, like an acting coach or something. So he knew that this was a real opportunity for him. I mean, this was season one. And oh, that this was a real opportunity. He was gonna, he wasn't gonna mess it up. He was gonna get people to help. He was gonna get people to make sure he was gonna be good in this. And he, of course, was. I can kind of speak to that in 2001 or 2002, if I'm not mistaken. He filmed in Jacksonville a film with uh, John Travolta called Lonely Hearts. And I was lucky enough at that time, I was still doing extra work, clearly. Um, but I met him on set and he couldn't have been nicer. And it's kind of like, here's Tony Soprano. He doesn't know me from anybody and he's treating me like I'm a human being. And that's why I say when I make it in the industry, I'm always going to treat people with the respect they deserve. So it's good to hear stories like that by him and Clint, that they're actually talked to people the way they're supposed to be talked to. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I find that, I mean, once in a while, you, you'll find a bad apple, but, but most of the time, the people who are really talented and are also really, really good people, I've found. I've found that it, it usually works out pretty nicely. And I'm always very grateful for that, too. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, especially when you spend so much time together on a set, and just be right. Be, they become, kind of become like a second family during production a lot of the times on the uh, films and TV. Um, uh, jumping into 2006 now, of course, you start in The Good Shepherd, which has 
too many great performances to mention. But of course, Bobby, uh, aka Mr. He has AKA to Mr. Robert De Niro directed this film. Um, could you mention what it was like working with him? And if I can also think about it with Clint Eastwood, like were there any differences or were there similarities? What was it like working with him? And was there any comparison between the two? Uh, comparing them. That's interesting. I've never thought about that. I mean, I think, well, Clint, I think has directed more films. He's been a director mm -hmm. for a longer time. So I think perhaps in his mind, maybe he's thinking about the edit, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I think with Mr. De Niro, it was more like he is so the actor that he wanted to make sure we had all the freedom and what we wanted, you know, and, and have our time, mm -hmm. but maybe not thinking so much about how the whole thing was going to go together. I think maybe he relied on somebody else to do that. I don't, I don't know. But with Clint, I think right. he was already like editing in his mind already in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, but they were both really, really wonderful and respectful and fun to work with and um, and of course, Robert De Niro was acting in The Good Shepherd as well. So there were scenes when I was playing the piano with the Christmas songs and he, he comes in and sits in the chair. And, uh, but getting the role was really interesting. You know, my role was very small. In fact, my character's name was The Faceless Woman. That was my character's name in the script. I was playing uh, Bill Hurt's wife and it said The Faceless Woman. So um, there were three scenes and like, you know, one line, two lines in each of the scenes. So I, oh, you got a, you got a call back go in the room with Mr. De Niro. And I reminded him that literally like 20 years before that, when I was doing the real thing, actually, I had auditioned for the movie, The Mission, Roland Joffe movie. And Robert De Niro was in it. And, and I had a improvisation session with Robert De Niro for an hour. Oh, wow. And, and, and we were in this room together. There was a piano. So I ended up playing some piano and we improvised. And I reminded him at the Good Shepherd audition that, that we had had that time together. And it was like, oh, and then we talked about music. I talked about uh, Arbo Parrot, this Lithuanian composer. And he said, oh yeah, I'm thinking about using some of his music. And we had this great conversation. I started the audition and I did the first scene, you know, two lines. And then I'm starting to go to the second scene and he gets up from the couch and I'm like, oh, oh, he wants me to leave. Okay, that's my cue. I guess he's had enough. I'm Okay, I'll stop doing bad acting. I'll leave now. And he comes up to me and he grabs my hand. He says, I want you to do the role. And it was the first time somebody offered me the role in the room. And oh. it, was, I, it just blew my mind. I said, oh my God, it should always be like this. Yes. And as we were coming out of the, I came out of the room with the casting director. I said, really, did that just happen? Did he just give me the role? And he said, yeah, but don't say anything because there's other people auditioning. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> was, was he like whispering? Was he like whispering to the cast or were they like having like a sidebar before he shook your hand or did he just like make an executive decision right there? He made an executive decision. And you know, then I later found out that the casting director told me that in some ways he was looking for like karmic circles to be completed. Like he cast his friend, Amy Wright, who had been in the deer hunter with him. Mm -hmm. Maybe me telling him the story about the fact that, you know, I got so close 20 years ago. And then he thought, Oh, karmically, maybe she should have, you know, like right. that he was making these kinds of uh, connections and choosing people for certain reasons for a karmic circle to be complete in some way, which I thought was pretty cool. That's really interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> in uh, 2009 to 2010, you play uh, Priscilla Antrim, Richard Antrim's played by Oliver Platt's wife in Bored to Death. I love that show. Um, can you tell us what that experience was like on set working on that series? Oh, it was a lot of fun, except, you know, I was the straight man, you know, those guys got to do all the jokes, Ted Dance and, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and on Oliver Platt, you know, I knew a little bit because he'd gone to school with my sister at no, Tufts no. University in Boston. So I knew Oliver uh, sort of socially uh, before that. So that was easy. And Ted Danson, once again, totally great, nice, fat, fabulous person. Um, my only frustration was like, I want to be funny too, you know, but I, I was the straight woman, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll be the straight woman for those guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2012, now again, you start with, with Winona Ryder in The Letter, playing a doctor. Um, you have a very big range with your roles. So what I wanted to know was, first and foremost, how do you prepare for your roles? And for instance, is there a difference when you're playing, uh, is there any different preparation when you're playing a wife or a doctor or a U.S. ambassador or whatever? Because again, like you say, at one point you're being typecast, but also you still want to be able to show this range. So what type of preparation goes into it? And tell us about that process. Uh, well, for example, with Homeland, I interviewed um, a couple of ambassadors 
because I knew I knew the kind of technical part of all of that, but I wanted to know what the real day to day life was. Like I said, like when you wake up in the morning, like what is it? And she told me, oh, there's so many dinners you have to go to, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. Nice. And, and she was sort of giving me the visceral part of it. Do you know? Like yes. how long is your day? What do you eat? You got to eat that, you know, that catered stuff every. I mean, I wanted to know the the smell, taste, feel, sound of being an ambassador instead of just the officious. This is what I do with my brain every day, mm -hmm. and of course, then making her just a woman who's got a husband who's, you know, kind of bored and with her and sort of trying to keep that relationship. So I kind of go to the uh, as you said. I mean, that's really. I mean, I that's. Uh, smart Torian that that you you know you don't want to go right into the cliche of something you know you want to actually almost find the opposite sometimes I always find that as much as one a person is this they are also this to the same degree in the opposite direction and in doing that then you create a three-dimensional person people make the mistake of going oh I'm playing this so I can only do this and then I'm this and then you're not you're not fully developed you know you're that yes. you're everything you could do anything Yes, um, and, really and to give that character as much room and expansion as, as you can find. Um, playing, you know, uh, someone like Katarina Rostova in, in the blacklist, you know, it's all very secret. I can't really say I have signed a non-disclosure, but, you know, to, to people, they look at her and they see this really evil person. But for me, I have to know the, the motivations. And sometimes when people do very cruel things I always try to look for the kernel of pain inside them that that made them you know warp into that person or, or bent them to be the kind of person who would do these terrible things the psychology of the character is what you're delving into is yes. what I'm hearing absolutely and even like when I played had a gobbler uh, Ibsen's had a gobbler you know, Ibsen doesn't give uh, the actress a lot of uh, excuses for what she does, but I had to figure out why. So um, in our production of Hedda Gobbler, you know, I mean, she's pr uh, pregnant, but you never hear about her mom. So then I went, oh, oh, her mother died in childbirth. So she's terrified of being pregnant. So I had to find mm -hmm. a reason. Why is she so, you always want to find the reason, go back and if the playwright doesn't give it to you, then you got to going to make something up to make that work for yourself you know definitely shows the preparation you put in especially how you say you prepare because all the characters i've seen you play they even in the small moments in planes trains and automobiles they always have this three-dimensional tangible feel where it's not just like a one it's never a one note thing it's never a villain or a hero there's always this complicated nuance to it which i appreciate um, well, thank you. In uh, 2014, as we mentioned earlier, you're in Homeland as Martha Boyd, the U.S. ambassador. Your character shares a very uh, compelling toe-to-toe -to -toe dynamic with Carrie, played by Claire Danes. Um, Martha Boyd is so composed in the face of Claire Danes' very, very intense uh, Carrie Matheson. Um, as an actress who has shared the screen with so many great performers, do you... Uh, you know, you, you prepare for the role and then you're you're in the scene with whoever you're in the scene with. Do you allow that at all to dictate how you're how you're approaching the scene? Uh, um, absolutely, because you have to be responding to what that person is giving you and not how you made it up in your own head at home, you know. Uh, and that's always an interesting uh, learning curve that I that <clears throat> if you go to a set and you haven't had the opportunity to rehearse, that's something you have to uh, assimilate quickly. That, that's one of the skills, I think, as you work more and more in front of the camera and you don't have that rehearsal time that you, you process that and integrate it into your performance. That's why when I'm learning my lines, I, I learn them, but I don't set how I'm going to do them. Uh, I think about what I'm trying to do and then when I meet that person, I go, well, how am I going to try to do that to that person, that specific person? Uh, and that's why I rehearse my lines in many different ways. And I like to rehearse them on the elliptical or when I'm walking, because I need to get the lines in my body. Mm -hmm. You know, wh how many times have we all laid in bed and think, oh, yeah, I know these lines for tomorrow. And then you get up <laughs> and you start walking around and breathing. And it's like, I guess I don't know these lines, you know, I mean, <laughs> you got to get them in your body. And you got to be super, super, super specific. 
so that when you're dealt these new things, oh, I got a new prop. Oh, I got these kids. These are my kids. I like, well, planes, trains, and automobiles. They're like, these are your kids. Okay, oh, there's no time to create a relationship. So all these things are being thrown at you on a set. And that's why being super prepared with your lines is so important because all these things are going to start to push you off center and make you go up or not remember or, oh, I, I've never didn't practice it that way. You have to be loose. You have to be flexible. You have to be in the moment. You have to deal with that person and you have to be ready to bend and take direction and try things and stand things on their head. And, um, and in that there will be like a fluidity that'll be really delicious in your performance because you aren't set. So you're getting into the, you get into the psychology, the headspace of the character, all the nuances of them. You get the lines in your head so that you're pretty much, it's almost like second nature. Like you can respond in real time and character if needed on set. They call that being a true artist. <laughs> because when you say you're this or that, you're, like you're acting. No, I'm sorry, but we're, when we're supposed to be a trained actor and actress, we should never just be one thing. We should be a ball of clay. And I think so many people get caught up in just being one thing. Or like you say, learning those lines. I'm going to go in there, I'm going to nail it. Well, who are you working with? Who are you, what's your relationship? So I, I thank you for saying that. I know a lot of actors and actresses need to hear that. So I'm glad you said that. Speaking of switching it up and being flexible, of course, you go from U.S. ambassador to FBI agent in the 2018 series, Deception. Can you tell us about your character on that show, ma'am? I was kind of the Miss Bossy Pants in that, you know. <laughs> they, they got to go out and do all the interesting things. And I was at home, you know, with the monitors, you know, pointing at green screens with nothing on them, pretending to see things, you know, and a lot of technical jargon, which is kind of probably my least favorite thing to memorize is uh, a bunch of technical stuff, you know. Um, and in some ways, I wanted to kind of spice her up in some way or do something. But often I was told, no, just keep her really, really kind of straightforward. She's kind of a suit. So in some ways I felt a little uh, straight jacketed in, in that role mm -hmm. um, because there weren't any other scenes about her life. It was all, all in that office. So I was really sort of functioning as the person who dished out the job. Um, whereas I guess I, what I find more interesting is then having your life fleshed out in some way. Yeah. Uh, like when I did Murder in the First with uh, uh, the Tay Diggs show, mm -hmm. um, I was a lawyer, but I also had um, a relationship. And I, I think that was the first time I played a lesbian. And so I had this relationship at home and which was complicating my work. So I always like having the private story too, along with the, with the officious part of it. And deception, I didn't get to do much of that, so. <laughs> <laughs> in 2019, you started in a film called Impossible Monsters, and we hadn't heard of this before doing our research on you, but it does, I, I watched the trailer um, when I was putting the questions together, and it looked very intriguing. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it and the role you played in that. Well, it's a kind of a film noir-ish kind of mystery, uh, murder mystery thing. Um, it's interesting because it's, 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 it takes place in the art world and this painter and the paintings were beautiful. They got this artist to make these paintings that they used in the film. They were just beautiful. I'm very Francis Bacon, actually, very kind of violent paintings. And I play the college, uh, I think it was the, the dean of the college, if I'm not mistaken. Sometimes I forget things as soon as I finish. I can't remember anything about them. Um, at the dean of the college uh, and... Uh, uh, there's some machinations about getting somebody a, a promotion and you don't know who done it. It's kind of a who done it thing. And it, but it's kind of a, it's shot very, um, it's very sexily shot. It's very, it kind of draws you in. It's, it's an interesting film. Yeah. It, look, it looks great. Yeah, it's yeah, definitely true. on my list to check out now. Yeah. Um, also in 2019, you play uh, Pamela Joy, as you mentioned, the mother of Serena Joy in Handmaid's Tale. Uh, this is a mother like your role in The Sopranos that is very complicated. She's obsessed with status, arguably more suffocating than she is supportive of her daughter. Um, when you're playing a role like this, do you take any additional measures to maybe like not pal around with the co-star in your scene um, to maintain like a certain emotional distance between them? Or is there anything like that? Or do you just do you draw the line between action and cut? <laughs> Well, there really wasn't any time to pal around with Yvonne, although, you know, playing her mom, it would have been great to, to have time with her. And, and actually, Yvonne had just had a baby. So when she came to the set, uh, she was, every time we weren't actually between action and cut, she was in the trailer with the baby. 
Um, so I got very little uh, time with her. So all of it had to happen really pretty much between action and cut. But um, right away, looking at her and feeling her energy, I felt there was a simpatico there, which I understand why I got cast to be her mom. Um, I think she's a po maybe Polish descent, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm Latvian and we're, you know, in that second neck of the woods. And I just felt there was something about her that I recognized, you know, in looking at her face thinking, oh yeah, that, that could be my daughter. And, uh, and she's a wonderful actress. And we were just, you know, we just, we just did the work, but there wasn't a lot of outside. No, it was all very quickly done, but yeah, I felt connected to her out. almost like right away, you know? Yeah. That's the other thing, you know, when I did The Good Shepherd with Bill Hurt, I felt that off between, when we weren't acting, I found it very kind of challenging to relate to him or chat with him. But between action and cut, I felt like we'd been married for 45 years. It was the craziest thing. Because in The Good Shepherd, we go through many, I think we go through like a 40 year span as a couple. And, and granted, we, I didn't have a lot to do with him, but there was a place where we were dancing together in a ballroom. And literally they would say action, he would dance with me. And I, and I just felt this energetic thing from him where I felt we had been married for 45 years. Wow. That's awesome. It was, it was bizarre. That is, that is amazing. Let's, <laughs> let's go, let's take a trip down memory lane. Let's go to 1987. I'm a young, young man, young child falling in love with acting, sitting in front of the TV, realizing this is what I want and will do with the rest of my life. And one of those films that did it for me was of course, planes, trains, and automobiles. So let's talk a moment about that. And let me first ask, I know when the last time we've seen it. When's the last time you've actually watched it? <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, I went to the premiere in 1987. And I think I saw it maybe once between then and now. And I think I saw it last year because I was like, you know what? A lot of people talk about this movie. <laughs> maybe I should see it again. <laughs> I really and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was so charming. And I thought it really held up. Oh yeah. yeah, it's a classic, oh. right? It's just never going to oh, go yeah. away. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I, I read that it was that Roger Ebert watched it every Thanksgiving. That was the film that he watched, like mm. traditionally. Oh, um, it really draws. It pulls at your heartstrings. It's really very, oh yes, very special. Yes. They had already been shooting for a long time. I, I was like the last thing they shot. And so mm. they got back to LA. They've been in Chicago and different places shooting snow. You know. And then we did a bunch of my scenes on the phone and I had these kids and, oh, actually the first time I went out there, uh, they had built this house for the interiors. And I think John Hughes said, I don't, I don't like this house. And they sent me back to New York for a week. And then I came back and then we shot it. And of course, when I went to the premiere, I was devastated because most of me was on the cutting room floor. Oh. And uh, but you know, given a choice between John Candy and Steve Martin and Lila Robbins, who are you going to cut? Well, I heard that plenty of John Candy and Steve Martin were cut as well. I think the original cut was over four hours, four and a half hours, on a, like a hundred and forty-two oh. page script. Yes. Um, yeah, and it's funny yeah. you mentioned the house because I, I read that the the house in the film was a set built from scratch. It took five months to complete. It cost over uh, one hundred grand. <laughs> It oh. And it kind of caused turmoil on the set with anger yes. Paramount executives. Um, did you have, did you, were you privy to any of this? Uh, like uh, during production? I knew that they were weeks over as far as how long it was taking to shoot the film. And I, and I'd heard that they were a lot of money over. In fact, to the point where I thought, well, maybe not even going to shoot me because they don't have any more money um, or time. Um, so I, that's all I'd kind of heard. And then the whole thing about getting there and then him, and then John Hughes saying, I don't, I don't like how this interior looks and going, oh my God, are they going to really rebuild the whole thing? Um, and I don't know to what extent they did or just did a little redecorating, some new curtains or something. I don't know. But, uh, but it all was changed. And, um, you know, that was my first Hollywood movie. So I, I didn't ask a lot of questions. I just showed up. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of apparent that a lot of scenes with you are not in the final film because it's almost like you can catch glimpses of them when um when they're when uh steve martin is like reminiscing or things like that it's like wow did they really it seemed like without that like one particular example i have is when he's 
thinking about uh, Thanksgiving dinner and it shows him sitting down with you, it's like that feels like that was a longer scene and it wasn't time for it. So they just repurposed it for this one quick moment. Um, and then like when you're coming down the stairs at the end, it felt like there was something that happened in between the moment that like, or that that was, it just, it felt like it was repurposed in a certain way. It's still an amazing movie and, and hats off to the editors and John Hughes for the decisions made in post because we're taking three hours and 40 or over four hours down, to, it down to that the around 90 minutes and having that well yeah. the story is just amazing but was there a lot of um like could you speak on that like was there like a particular scene that that you really enjoyed shooting that wasn't in the final cut there might have been a scene with my mother or something talking about worrying about, you know, where is my husband? Why isn't he coming home? There was, you know, I don't, there was another phone call, uh, but that didn't work out so well because the game of the lines the night before there was this huge phone call and I'm not a quick study. So that didn't, that didn't go so well. <laughs> so I think maybe they got that. Um, I mean, I loved, I mean, finally working with John Candy and Steve Martin. That was a great, I think we only worked like two days on that whole Thanksgiving and coming down the stairs thing. And that was so fun because they were both so adorable and funny and sweet. And, um, and uh, yeah, a lot of people respond to that the moment when I come down the stairs. It's funny, you know. I was going to ask, how does it feel like you, you're, you're on these shows and we all can hope as artists to all be a part of something that's timeless. I like, like as you mentioned, it's a classic and people are going to put this in space capsules and send it off to space 100 years from now. How does it feel to be a part of such an iconic film or iconic project that people will know you? It's people who know they know you, Lila, all over the world. But just from walking down to out of all the stuff you've done, they know you as a woman that walked down the stairs. Neil's wife. Well, it's interesting because I haven't been uh, I haven't been that aware of that phenomenon. Actually, I, I I think for years, you know, people would would say, "Oh, planes, trains, and automobiles." But in my mind, at that time in my career, I was like, "Oh, I want them to remember other things too." You know, I've been doing some other work since then. You know, but now it's really fun to hear that so many people respond to it. I don't know. Um, it's weird, all of that, or that people. You know, since Homeland, more people are recognizing me on the street and people recognize me sometimes in New York subway from Law and Order. I've done mm -hmm. a lot of Law and Order episodes, so they'll kind of look at me. But New Yorkers are cool. They don't they'll come up to you and start screaming. They just kind of point at you and go. And then you <laughs> I know go, you. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so to be uh, more uh, uh, recognized, I guess, is... Um, it's nice, but I also can understand that if it gets to a whole other level, that it can really be very difficult. I mean, people like, you know, whatever, Jennifer Aniston goes out and she can't walk down the street without somebody, you know, accosting her. I'm kind of in that great sort of middle level where people will recognize me, but they won't know my name. Or um, oh, my, favorite, my favorite thing is when people come up to you and they say, oh, you are on this and you're like, Oh no, actually I wasn't in that film. Oh no, you were, you were in that movie. And I'm like, uh, actually I wasn't. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> they know you better than you. They know you, that's right. <laughs> um, we have uh, two Johns to remember today. I want to talk first about uh, Mr. Hughes. Uh, he has such a, uh, he had such a, such a signature style that was, I mean, he, he pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, he wrote the eighties for me. Um, can you speak on his process from working with him and if there's any memory that you have? At the end of the whole shoot, I sort of asked him, you know, you know, I hope I did a good job for you. And uh, what would you have done differently, you know, if we'd had more time? And he said, oh, I, maybe we would have rehearsed more or something. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, my time with him was very, very short. I was there maybe a week at total. Mm -hmm. And, right, we'll um, and I wasn't that uh, savvy in uh, really even paying attention to someone's process because I hadn't had that much experience. So I had nothing yeah. to compare it to, you know what I mean? Right, well, I guess that, that leads us to our next one. Of course, we would be remiss if we didn't mention, of course, you also work with Mr. John Candy as well. And he was like everyone's favorite uncle, no pun intended, Uncle Buck, through the 80s and 90s. Of course, a, a comedy treasure. Uh, d d during the short time that you were there, what was it like to kind of work with him? And do you have any favorite memories or times with him, the short time you spent with him? 
Oh, he was just exactly how he is in the film. He's just a sweetheart. And I think he uh, said he lived in Toronto. He had a Canadian accent. He was Toronto and he, he go to church every Sunday with his family. And he just seemed like a regular, uh, you know, a regular family man, uh, sweet. And um, yeah. Okay, now question, was the ending of the film shot last or when did that scene wrap in production? Like what, what part, what was the flow on that? I think that Thanksgiving scene was the last scene we shot. Talk about a martini so. shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so, yeah. We had all this food at the table and I think we were at that table for a couple of days. So I think those were the last. Yeah. I wish there had been a martini after that, but. <laughs> Um, before we move on from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, was there any other uh, memories or, from set or anything that you'd like to share? Uh, no, I just kept thinking, oh, gosh, and I'm in this fabulous movie with these guys, and I wish I had more stuff with them, you know, because that would have been fun. <laughs> now, uh, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, um, if we can jump back into, I guess, the, 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 uh, the 2000s or the, uh, to the 20th century here. Most recently, you starred in The Boys, of course, making big waves on social media and The Blacklist, which we discussed earlier, a show that is still going, yet yeah, feels like a classic at the same time. It's one of those things mm -hmm. like you, you want to enjoy it in the t moment of time you're in. So th these cap off such, and I mean such an impressive resume that we only barely scratched the surface of today. So yeah. I just really want to say, if, if I can say it, like, again, I'm a fan of yours. And again, like I say, it's just an honor to even been interviewing you today. You're such a person's person. And I, I really do like this. Um, and just for someone who has navigated the industry from multifacets over an impressive period of time, um, what is the best piece of advice that you could offer to someone who's considering a career in acting? Ah, oh, yeah, I've been asked this um before and I guess I always want to emphasize that you have to love the craft you know I mean I think a lot of young people get into the business because they think uh it's going to be exciting or it's going to be sexy or you're going to make a lot of money or you're going to be famous and all those things are possible but mm -hmm. the thing is you have to love the thing itself and you have to do the work because the readiness is all, you know, there's so much emphasis for the younger people with the social media and looking a certain way and having this, the many likes and that and this, and there's all that. And that's all great. And I wish I was better at it because I don't, I don't know how to do any of it. Uh, obviously that would help me, but I sometimes think it's like, we're missing, you know, the forest for the trees. It's like, it's like the craft, you have to know what you're doing. The, as Hamlet would say, the readiness is all. You get this opportunity, you get on a set and you don't know what you're doing, then you've lost your opportunity. You know, there's only one, uh, uh, one time to make a first impression, as they say. Yeah. And, and you want to, you want to, I mean, you wouldn't go out and play the violin without practicing, right? Um, <laughs> so why do people think that they can just be an actor because they have a resume photo? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a crap. There's, a, there's an art to it. Oh, that's what I wanted to say when we were talking earlier. Um, you know, a true artist, as you're saying, there's passion and there's form. If you just have all passion, you just, and you have no form, it's not art. If you just have form, but no passion in it, and that's not so good either. It's together, but it's work. It's work. <laughs> you got to show up. You know, people come into rehearsal I remember when I was younger, I'd go into rehearsal and go, yeah, well, I'm gonna kind of do it something like this. No, I use every second of rehearsal because I know that two weeks into the run, I'm gonna still be finding new things. And had mm -hmm. I been working 110% at the get-go, I'd be that much further along into the complexity or the depths of something. There's, 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 there's never enough time. And there's, um, it's like there's always this old funny story about a Russian director, you know, in Russia, they take a year to rehearse some play. That's how they do it. They just rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. So the dire Russian director comes over to America and uh, the producer says, well, how many weeks of rehearsal do you need? And he says, I would like six months of rehearsal. And the producer says, oh my God, I can't afford that. I can't, I can't pay for six months. And the Russian says, okay, two weeks. <laughs> I mean, you, you use as much time as you have. Right. You know, you gotta do what you gotta do. And with film and TV, you gotta do a lot on your own before you get to that to the day because you got a lot of people counting on you and there's a lot of money like hemorrhaging and if you don't know your lines hello um so i would i just say love the craft um don't give up 
there, oh, things can always change. I mean, in the boys, you know, I mean, no, in, in um, the blacklist, I'm like breaking people's necks and shooting people, you know, who knew that I would be an action figure at my age? I mean, come on. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, strange shit happens. It's crazy. Right. So at any moment, you're, that's the thing, you know, as they say in the business, you can't make a living, but you can make a killing. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and your, your life can change. And I think that's the seduction of acting too, is that you know that at any moment, the right role that suits you perfectly could come along and you could shine in a way that'll make you stand out. And in the meantime, you, you plot along and you try to stay you know, employed and you try to stay hooked in. And when you're not doing something, go see your friends in work, go, go watch work, analyze why you like their work. What is it about what that person just did that works for you? Are you capable of doing that? Analyze it, be a scientist about it, break it down, make it a craft and then throw your passion into it and pray that a role that suits you come along. <laughs> that is excellent advice. It so is. love the craft, but more importantly, respect the craft. <laughs> yes, and it's as me and him yeah. always talk about, anything worth having is worth working for. So we wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, before we let you go, I want to ask, we always like for our guests to speak to what they may have coming up. Is there anything you have coming up that you can speak about that we can let people know? And of course, where we can find you at online. I am um, doing uh, some more for the blacklist. Uh, mm -hmm. I was on last week and I'll be on this week. Um, and the boys, I'll be going back to do some more episodes in season three, of the boys. And I'm in the process of working on a miniseries uh, called Dr. Death mm -hmm. for Peacock uh, channel. And uh, Dr. Death is a fascinating story, a tr true story of Dr. Dunch, a Texas spinal surgeon. And it's a fascinating story. And uh, I play the CEO of Baylor Plano Hospital. And uh, yesterday I got to work with uh, my friends, Alec Baldwin and Christian Slater. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the lead is being played by Joshua Jackson, who was on oh. Broadway last year in uh, Children of a Lesser God, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an eight part mini series. And I'm really excited about that because once again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of stretch it a little bit. I'm, I'm putting on a bit of a Texas accent and I got some Texas hair. <laughs> that's my motto acting is hair <laughs> i love having a wig because i like to i like to change my my look you know um mm -hmm. so that's coming up and um that's what i know oh. yeah and that's then we'll be you know nice. pounding the pavement again as <laughs> one does and that's the thing you know i also want to say for young people you know when you go into an audition here's two things when you don't get it, you know, it, often it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with so many subjective things, how you match up with somebody else, how they want to go. It really doesn't matter. What's a fascinating thing for young people to do is sit in on auditions and see how that all goes and, and start to understand how things work or how just when you walk through the door, how that can make a difference. Um, and the other thing is when you're auditioning, do you know how when you audition for something, you're sort of nervous and then you get the job and the next day you're at the table read and everybody's your best friend. It's like, everything's cool. Mm -hmm. well, what, what was the energetic difference there? So what I, I was taught a technique where before your audition, create the sensation in your body of owning the role. Like how does your body feel when they call you and say, hey, they want you. And breathe that in and create that energy. If it, you own it, you already own the role. So when you go in, it's yours already. Instead of, do you like me? Do you want me? Do I kind of, huh, huh, huh? Mm -hmm. You have it already. There you go. And that'll, gra and that'll gravitate. That energy will work. Very excellent advice. And should right. be heated because she's... <laughs> She's turned down roles. <laughs> I'm talking to the other cameras. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, also, also, I want to say something, too, about if you're studying with a teacher, you know, sometimes it's a painful experience. I mean, class can be painful because you want to be good, right? And someone's saying, you know, adjust that, adjust that. And it's such a, oh, it's so uncomfortable and you can't do it right. And you don't want to, or you've got some sort of emotional blocks or something. But if you can keep your ego out of it, Keep the ego out of it and just try. And just when the director says, try this, then try it. 
and keep mm -hmm. your try to keep that ego out of the way so you have more access to changing and and uh, mutating and and being that piece of clay um but the ego is a powerful thing y you know you want to go no I'm, I'm 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 gonna do it my way mm. yeah. try to stay open try to stay open very sound advice um thank you very much for sharing too is there um is there anything that we somehow missed that you'd like to talk about before we go oh i just the, when you said some memories i mean when i was at williamstown where i got my start my first play was chekhov's ivanov with christopher walken and diane Ooh. wheat okay. and that was my first play and i was like oh my god i've died and gone to heaven i can't believe this is happening to me and chris walken <laughs> it was so funny I, I, as the young uh, character who was in love with his character, I touched him a lot in rehearsals, you know, because that was my bad actor habit of like, oh, I, I'm in love with him. And he'd go, Lila, <laughs> you hit me again. You touch me again. I'm going to have to hit you. <laughs> and after rehearsal, he'd lean over and go, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> oh, my God. My iTunes started again. <laughs> Um, so, anyway, but I have so just so many fond memories of so many wonderful actors, and I just feel you know like with tennis, like you play with better people, you get better, right? And so yeah. uh, I'm just ever grateful for all the uh, you know more experienced actors that had so much patience with me and were able to help me and guide me in in ways that I could absorb and accept. And um, you know that's all you want to do, right? Is get better. You just want to have more ease. Just get. You just want to get better and it never yeah. stops. That's the thing. You know, I did a play with Uta Hagen, famous acting teacher for so many people. We did a play together for nine months. The last performance, she comes off and she says, oh, now I know how to do that moment. <laughs> I mean, the woman never, ever stopped. This is nine months of the same play, day in and day out. And she was still discovering something and still working and still finding something. And that's, that's the, I mean, the joy of the craft. You know, some people get a job. They say, you want to see an actor get sad, give him a job or something. It's like they get the job and then they don't actually want to do the job or they don't actually enjoy the job. Oh my God, to go out on stage every night and be able to play and change it and try something different. And that's fun. It should be fun. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, so much, Lila, for taking the time to talk to us today. It has been enlightening and a pleasure. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. I had so much fun. And, you know, I think you're onto something, um, uh, you two of the exotic names, Torian and Durden. You know, when you wrote to me, I mean, I don't know why I said yes, Durden. But there was something about your name that was like, what this? what is this Durden? She wouldn't have responded to David, but Durden got through. <laughs> <laughs> but David is the better one. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for responding. And yeah, I, I, I hear you. I don't know how, why people are responding to me when they do either. I'm just as flabbergasted. So thank you very much for responding. And I hope you have a happy holidays and safe. Thanks, you too. And I really wish you both the best in your work and, 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 and in finding work and, and, and finding, you know, uh, where it gets sort of special and wonderful. And, you know, you're living up to your, your, your potential that that that's fun to kind of go oh yeah i think i almost i almost lived up to my potential on that one you know that was fun <laughs> thank, you. thank you again you have a safe holidays you will be seeing yourself thank on you. the screen very soon and we think we'll make it look good as a matter of fact you've already made us look good so thank you so much thanks a lot thank thanks guys thank you find us in all these links it's coming up right now Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer.